Welcome back to the Amazon Fanatics program. I am your host, Justin Simon. Every week we come down here to YouTube and we interview the biggest names and best in Amazon sales, PPC, uh, FBA. But today's guest I'm, I'm, I'm extra, extra excited about for a multitude of reasons. The first is a lot of the times we talk to sellers and they've talked about how they have achieved success and what you can do. And there are also times we've talked to experts in advertising and making sure that you know, your money goes as, as far as it can so that you can have success. But rarely do we talk to as many experts that are like today's guest. James Thompson is not only the president of the Prosper Show, which you could argue is the preeminent uh, Amazon and e-commerce convention anywhere, and this year it'll be uh, in March of next year, actually, in Las Vegas, and so we urge you to check that out. But additionally, he's also the former business head at AmazonServices.com, and he knows exactly what goes into recruiting sellers, making sellers successful, the difference between resellers and private laborers, and how each approach is different. And of course, having been at Amazon, now James didn't start the department, but he was a, a key, key figure in its expansion and success. And so one of the things we want to ask James as we get into today's interview is, well, how do you make it big if you're a seller, and how does Amazon help you? So uh, without further ado, we're going to welcome James Thompson to the show, and we're going to dive right in, James, and ask, when you're recruiting all of these people to become third-party sellers on Amazon, what is it you're looking for, and how do you know uh, what sets apart those who are going to have success uh, in the long run versus those who are going to try, give it a couple months, and no shot in the long run? So, Justin, the, the process of getting 100,000 sellers a year onto the Amazon platform means that not only do we have to target and find all of these sellers, but we also want to find a way to help them be successful. So, with 100,000 sellers, inevitably some of them won't be cut out to do this job, but they'll see the hundreds of millions of people shopping on Amazon, and they'll say, we, we can certainly make a go of this. I've got access to product. I've got access to capital. I'm going to get out there, and I'm going to show that I can, I can make this work. But unfortunately, a lot of folks don't make the cut, either because they're not particularly good at running small businesses, or they have challenges understanding the ins and outs of how Amazon runs its marketplace. As you know firsthand, and I'm sure most of the folks uh, who are listening today know firsthand, Amazon's kind of a weird place to do business. <laughs> there are a number of rules and regulations that aren't consistent with how many sellers will sell on other platforms or on other brick and mortar channels. So when I left Amazon, my my, one of my driving forces was around how do we educate a lot of sellers before they make that decision to jump into Amazon? How do we help them make the decision around are they cut out to be successful on Amazon? Are they cut out to handle all the day-to-day -day operations around answering customer inquiries and so on? Are they cut out to be able to deal with competitors who might have irrational pricing? These are all realistic forces that, that sellers face every single day. And I, I like to be in a position where we can help sellers make better decisions about what really they're facing on this Amazon marketplace. Well, it's so interesting you said that because you, you mentioned some traits that people have. When, when you look at some of the most successful sellers, what are some yes. of the traits that they had yes. that, that when you look at potential sellers or even potential customers for, for your businesses now, you say, okay, those are the traits we need to see in you that we know you'll have some success. So I think the very first one is you have to have discipline around the, the daily processes, the weekly processes, and the monthly processes that somebody might need to operate a business. What do I mean by that? Okay, every morning you get up, you sign into Seller Central, you look to see, do you have any performance issues? Do you have any customer inquiries? Do you have any soon to be out of stock products? Th those are some of the basics in terms of things that you have to do every single day. And when I say every single day, I mean Christmas, July 4th, New Year's Day, every single day someone has to do that. And so um, going back to the issue around are you cut out to be successful on Amazon, I've worked with a lot of companies who say, well, I'm really good at doing this elsewhere off of Amazon, so I'm sure I can do it on Amazon. But what they don't realize is that they are always on call if they're selling on Amazon. And so w while one particular individual may not necessarily be the same person every day, somebody on the team has to check in every single day. And that becomes a challenge, especially as your business builds and you discover that you're not going to be able to get away with two or three days on the weekend not checking your emails, not checking to see if customers have asked questions, or not checking to see if seller performance has sent you an astigram about something that you have to address immediately. So that, that's certainly one, one major uh, characteristic of sellers is, is the 
ability to do repetitive tasks every single day and to do it well every single day, even though nobody said it was going to be fun, but it has to be done every single day. Uh, I think another important aspect of this is understanding what are the tasks that have to be done uh, maybe on a monthly or a quarterly basis. And I'm talking around things like reviewing stale inventory, looking at uh, new products that need to be added to your catalog, because uh, realistically, if you're a reseller, for example, if you're a reseller, the products you sell today, I would expect 30 to 40% of those in six months from now, you're no longer going to have any sales on those products because somebody else or enough other companies will have tagged their offers onto the same listing. And you're going to be in a situation where there's really no more slice of the pie that's available to you because you're not willing to take, you know, three cents profit on, on the sale of an item. So being in a position where you can consistently reinvent yourself with new selection, potentially with new suppliers, certainly with new brands, uh, this is not a one and done type model. Just because you've got access to product today doesn't mean somebody else doesn't have access to the same product cheaper. Certainly doesn't mean that the, the advantage you have today won't be eliminated by somebody else in the future, including possibly Amazon retail. So being in a position where you can continuously adapt, being in a position where you can look at the same processes every day and repeat them smoothly every single day, th- those are really important characteristics. The third characteristic that I think differentiates a decent seller from a high-performing, long-term perspective seller is one that understands at some level how much profit they make on every single SKU. And I'm not talking about I buy an item at $10, I sell it at 20 and I back out Amazon's fees. I'm talking about all the other types of fees that are also there, like overhead, like return fees, right. like write-down fees. These are all real fees that do add up. And in many situations, certainly from my, my consulting experience, when we've gone through with clients and looked at this, it's not uncommon for a seller to stop selling 30 to 40% of their catalog immediately because they realize only Amazon's making money here. Wow. So if you're in a position where you're working really hard to build your small business and the only one making money is Amazon, yeah. I don't know about you, but I'm a capitalist, and I want to make money for for my clients and for myself. It's not about helping Amazon improve its bottom line. Amazon can do that without your help. Right. So, I'd like to see every seller be in a perspective in, in, in a position where they've got very clear perspective on what are my five most profitable products, what are my five least profitable products, how do they restru- or re-examine that data on a, on a quarterly basis to make sure that they aren't wasting their time selling a bunch of product. For somebody else to make money. And so. speaking of number of products, is there a sweet spot when you say, okay, you need to have at least this number of products at any given time to have any mm-hmm. success? And does that differ between private labelers and resellers? So let's talk about resellers. I think a reseller who, who recognizes that they are in the business of selling widgets, I don't really care how, how many widgets they have in their catalog. What's important to me is do they have a clear understanding of every single widget? Every widget basically is, it has its own P&L. It's got different competitors. It's got different uh, dynamics around pricing. It's got different issues around availability of replenishable inventory. You've got to understand that for every single SKU. If you have so many products in your catalog that there are certain chunks of catalog that you don't look at very often because either they don't sell very much or you just don't have time to look at all different parts on a regular basis, you're inevitably going to find that you're wasting a bunch of time selling product that you're not making money on. So I can't say to you, you should have 10 products, 100 products, 1,000 products. As a reseller, if you've got good software in place to help you track inventory and you've got some spreadsheets or, you, again, you've got good software to help you track profitability, you may be able to have tens of thousands of products. I mean, heck, look at some of the, the used media sellers out there. Right. They, they know how to buy a library worth of books, and they know with exact exact, exact down to the decimal, which products are going to make them five cents, which are going to make them five dollars and five cents. That that type of data discipline allows you to have much larger catalogs. I've also seen guys, you know, have like five or six products, but they've smudged so many costs around that they don't really understand which product or products make the money and which ones lose the money. I very much want sellers to take the time and break down costs as much as possible on a skew by skew basis so that they understand where they're making money. And if you're making money on all the products you sell, keep going, keep right. going. 
Keep expanding your selection. But there has to be this refining of, you know, drop the bottom 10, drop the bottom 15% of your of your catalog on a regular basis using some very specific cost data to know what's actually not making you money. And now, w- w- I want to ask you the other part of your question, which is if I'm a private labeler, Again, I, I may have, I may not have 10,000 products. Let's say I have 50 products, but the dynamic is very different in private label. Inevitably, whatever you've decided to private label, there's five other guys or gals out there also looking at exactly the same product. So to me, a private label business is really, how do I get in and get out? How do I get in and get out? So if I can get in on a product, I can get six months, maybe it's less than that, but I can get six months of, of hopefully positive profit with the full expectation that within six months there's no margin to be made on these products. So I, I'm going to have to continue to find the next product, the next product, the next product. So the, the daily discipline of a private labeler has got to also include some sort of regular research that says I expect that I have, I'm going to become obsolete with whatever I carry today. So what am I, what am I doing to make sure I can either further reduce the costs on the products I have to give me a little bit more of a runway to sell product and still be profitable? Or what am I doing to find the next 10, 20 products that I'm going to add to my catalog in the next three to six months? When I think about what private labelers, good private labelers basically do, they go do the research, they figure out the products, they go find somebody who can who can source the product for them uh, profitably, and then the seller takes that product and puts it through a process launches the product, gets the product reviews, gets some initial sales, gets some initial profit, make sure that they can replenish the first few times. And then inevitably, no matter how good they are at that, things start to decay because there's three or four other people out there building their own private label products that are better, cheaper, faster than uh, the, what, what, what this particular private labeler was doing. So uh, I think being a private labeler is a very good business if you're very disciplined and you accept the fact that all you do is sell widgets. You basically find widgets, you launch them, and then you let them slowly decay with the full expectation that you're birthing new new products all along the way. Well, we're talking with James Thompson, who's the president of the Prosper Show and a partner at buyboxexperts.com. And if you want to, you should probably pause this recording and go back and re-listen to everything James just said because about 97 questions popped into my head uh, while he was giving that last answer. Um, and, and so I want to kind of parse a bunch of what you said because it's very, sure. very interesting. First, you were talking about, you know, you only have about six months and, and there's been a lot of articles recently about how Amazon's going to start defending brands yep. uh, and people won't be able to sell certain products that, bigger brands, you know, even though they may have gotten them somewhere else, they originally came from a bigger brand and so the, the reseller aspect may suffer. Uh, <laughs> and then as a, a kind of second corollary to that is the question about how counterfeiting and the influx of counterfeiting from some of the Chinese suppliers is going to impact private labeling. So uh, I'm going to kind of give you a runway here and sure. let you, you just run on both of those for, for a minute, if you will. Sure. So let's talk about the, the counterfeit issue first as it relates to uh, sellers in other countries creating counterfeit versions of your private label product. So let's start with the, do you actually have a real brand? When you say you're a private label seller, I want to make a very important assumption that as a private label seller, you have a proper brand with a proper trademark, with proper packaging and logos and UPCs. If you have those kinds of characteristics in place, then you actually have a brand that that is worth protecting. Uh, I've worked with a number of private label sellers who are basically making generics, slapping a, a package, uh, a custom package and a custom logo on it, but but there's no unique differentiators of the product. It's right. not really a brand. I'm not talking about those types of sellers because that's a, that's a that's a different business and one that I, I'd rather not focus on right now. Sure. If I have a real brand with the right, as I say, the checkmark characteristics of a real brand, and I know that I'm going to launch it. I'm going to do a really good job of launching, getting that plane up in the air. It's going to start getting sales, getting sales quickly, but also getting a lot of attention from other sellers who are thinking about private labeling. And they say, well, gosh, if this guy can go from no sales rank to 100,000 in sales rank and do that in six months, I I have a plan overseas that can make the same product. Why can't I do that? And and sure enough, that's exactly what I'm talking about in terms of the decay of your your customer demand, what will happen with other sellers deciding to do the same thing. If some of those sellers are showing up with counterfeit product, certainly if you've got 
custom packaging with your logo uh, logo on the packaging as well as your logo on the physical product so it's not just the packaging but the product itself if you've got both of those the reality is under Amazon's rules today you're going to have to spend a bunch of time doing test buys and it feels kind of like a whack-a-mole situation where no matter what you do there's always somebody out there with a cheaper product um, that that it's probably not legitimate product because you 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 buy the whole lot from your supplier and yet somebody claims to have product available on this same item I don't have a silver bullet answer because there is no silver bullet answer today. Amazon is looking at ways to make brand registry owners give them a lot more uh, ability to control this sort of nonsense. Um, certainly, one of the things that I've seen is uh, if you have a if, let's say today you have ten products in your catalog and there's counterfeits on on all of those from the same the same seller over overseas or, or some other seller doesn't matter where they're located but let, let's say that you have a counterfeit seller or prospective counterfeit seller with offers on all 10 of your items today you're going to have to do a test buy on every single one of those 10 items and inevitably if that product's being merchant fulfilled from overseas there's two to three week lag at least before that product shows up at your doorstep that you can now file an infringement ticket with Amazon to say excuse me, but this is counterfeit product. In those two to three weeks, that seller is going to basically get 100% of the buy box right. selling product that's not really yours. And inevitably, you're going to end up in a situation where all the negative reviews that come in because the product that is being sold by this other company probably uh, isn't up to scratch with what you're trying to offer yourself. So it is a messy situation. Amazon is extremely aware of this. And in fact, Part of the situation you're seeing today and yesterday with regards to major brands like Nike, uh, those products now requiring an upfront uh, charge by Amazon for a seller to be able to list their, put their offers on existing listings. That That's a, in many ways a deterrent to help brands that are meaningful to Amazon and have had a long history of counterfeiters tagging on. If Amazon puts a few of these hurdles in place, the sellers who are selling counterfeits are still going to be there. It's just that they're going to move away from some of the strategic brands that are critical to Amazon today. So when I look at what 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 motivates counterfeiters, what motivates them is products they know they can get in and out of quickly and sell a lot of volume. Well, if you've got large national brands that have had a history of selling uh, a lot of counterfeit products, so sorry, not the brand, but, but there have been many counterfeiters tagged on those listings, uh, what better way to slow those counterfeiters down than to put a cost in front of them? It's not to say they're going to go away, but as, as a counterfeiter, um, it, you're simply going to move on to someone else if, in fact, you're on a very tight budget. The way I like to think about counterfeiting, just like I think about a, a lot of unauthorized or gray market sellers that some brands try, try to stop, is it's not about stopping every one of them. It's about putting a few hurdles in place a few hurdles more in place than what other brands have. And what inevitably happens is you push these sellers to go somewhere else. And if you're a brand or you're a reseller with an exclusive relationship from a brand or you're a private labeler who's trying to protect his or her brand, whatever you can do to put certain hurdles in place to, to shoo away these types of uh, uh, questionable sellers, that's really what the game is about. Amazon's putting these these big dollar amounts in place, I suspect specifically to get these sellers to think very hard about whether these are the brands they're going to go after, brands that Amazon has already deemed to be too strategic to their, their business to have to face so many counterfeits. Let me give you an example. Um, when I first joined Amazon, I used to run the third-party sports business. The number one selling sports item at the time was the P90X DVD set. And it sold an insane number of, of units every single day. Every single morning, I would get to work, and I would remove somewhere between 40 and 60 counterfeit listings that had shown up since the day before. Wow. Now, Amazon really detests gating products. Absolutely detests it. They like to have an open marketplace where there's an opportunity for other people who have product to be able to sell those offers, often at a lower price because they have you know, a couple of units that they got from... You know, grandma sent me something for my birthday. I don't want it. I'm going to sell it back. Amazon loves that kind of commerce. The problem is when you have products that are so widely counterfeited, it becomes basically a full-time job to do nothing but control the listings on a particular item. I can speak from firsthand experience. 
I spent the better part of half an hour every single day removing, as I say, 40 to 60 counterfeiters every day. And I knew full well that tomorrow another 40 to 60 of them would show up. And we're talking in situations like that, the, the, a product that sells for, let's say, $150 retail, the counterfeits show up at $25. Now, as a customer, I may say, I suspect there may be a problem here, but because it's essentially electronic content, right. what's the deal? Do I care, right. right, is the question, whereas the company and Amazon do care. If I buy a $150 pair of, of Nikes, but I can get it for $30, it, it may be lower quality, but in the end of the day, I own 10 pairs of running shoes, right. and so does it really matter? Um, so I, I think it's it's not a surprise to me that Amazon is putting some kind of hurdles in place to prevent or at least to get uh, counterfeiters to rethink. I recognize that these types of hurdles are also going to slow down the ability of, of gray market sellers or retail arbitrage sellers to be able to sell product. Um, but Amazon spends so much time having to deal with complaints from customers and complaints from authorized resellers um, around some of these these products that may or may not be legitimate, but it's easier for Amazon to say, we already have 20 sellers that we've been able to vet on these listings. I don't need the next 20. And I suspect Amazon is moving in a little bit more in that direction that it, it it's not really beneficial to have 50 sellers of the same product. If you have 20, that's great. Now, don't quote me on the number 20, sure. but, but, but this, the idea here is that you can get to a point where you have enough competition, enough selection, that by having vetted every one of those offers on, on a particular listing, that's good enough, and it doesn't really do do you much much. Uh, uh, it doesn't you don't gain much as a marketplace having the next twenty sellers who you haven't been able to vet. And I think Amazon's uh, Amazon's just uh, getting realistic that they can't spend all of their time tracking down every single offer on listings that they know have a high propensity to be counterfeited. Well, and, the, and as you say, that serves as a cautionary tale. If you're looking at some of the bigger brands and, and you're saying, well, it happened to them, it happened to them, it happened to them, and you decide to go off in another direction and, and maybe try to counterfeit that, you, you have to know in the back of your head at any given time you could be shut down or you could be facing a fee or, or whatever it is. And so you may say, okay, let me stay away from that counterfeit angle and let me try to do something else. And so, you know, I, I do think that, that, that Amazon's uh, supporting the big brands, I think is probably a good thing in the long run, uh, especially from a quality standpoint. Now, you mentioned having, you know, 20 or 30 or 50 sellers, which mm -hmm. brings us to kind of one of your, and I'm sure there are numerous areas of expertise, but as you're the partner of buyboxstrategies.com, uh, I'm sorry, buyboxexperts.com, um, you know, getting that buy box is so, so vital, uh, you know, because so rarely do most people even know they're, they, they, they may see the other op offers from, mm -hmm. but so rarely do people actually click on that. Right. What is the way that, that new sellers, when they are trying to figure out their strategy, can say to themselves, okay, here is my timeline, here's what I need to do to get that buy box so that I can really see, you know, a jump in sales velocity and really help my entire program. All right. So let, let's let's separate resellers for private labelers here. Um, if I'm a private labeler and I've got brand registry on my product and I have list, I put proper list prices or map prices on my listings and I am selling the product, I should be able to win the buy box. And because I don't really have anybody else, hopefully with offers on the same on the same listing. Right. So let's let's put that aside. If I'm a traditional reseller getting product from wherever it is I get product, and there's lots of competition on the same listing, then the question becomes, what am I doing differently from everybody else? Th there's basically two major issues that, that I can affect immediately as a seller. Number one, price. I can give the product away, you know, and win the buy box. Good for me. Now I lost a lot of money, but at least I got the buy box. The, the second thing I can do is I can put the product in FBA, because FBA is going to create such an advantage in, in the buy box algorithm that if there's no other sellers using buy box, or excuse me, no other sellers using using FBA, I, I will get a significant advantage. Not to say that that alone will make it possible for me to win the buy box, but that particular offer on that listing, if put in FBA, I'm in a good, much better position to win the buy box. The problem is, um, and I'm, I'm going to give you an example from, for example, from from health and beauty. It's not uncommon to have 20 companies all selling the same product, all in FBA, and guess what? It's a map price product. Everybody's selling it at you know, $25.99. They're all in FBA. 
And quite frankly, what am I supposed to do as a seller to get more than my fair share? Right. If there's 10 sellers all in FBA, it doesn't matter how many non-FBA sellers are. For all intents and purposes, the pie is going to get split across all the FBA sellers. And while I may not get exactly one-tenth, for example, if there's 10 sellers, I'm going to get roughly one-tenth of the sales. What do I do to get more than a tenth? Well, there's a few things you can do. Uh, you could you could do some aggressive advertising outside of Amazon to drive traffic to your particular offer on the listing. For example, we, we we've seen companies spend money on on Facebook advertising that drives specifically to to the the offer on Amazon. If Amazon finds that you as a seller you get better conversion when you're the buy box winner, they will actually improve the likelihood that you get the buy box the next time. So let's say there are 10 of you, all with FBA, all the same price on a particular item, and yet one of you somehow ends up with three times the sales. And it's in part because you're driving traffic from off of Amazon onto Amazon, such that when you're the buy box winner, you're getting the sale. Uh, the, ne the neat thing about doing advertising off of Amazon and driving it back to Amazon is I don't actually have to be the buy box winner. All I do is I direct people directly to my offer on the listing. So the concept of buy box doesn't really apply because all I'm doing is direct them to my particular offer. Inevitably, if Amazon sees that you're getting a lot more sales, all other things being equal, they can give you an advantage in the algorithm so you get more sales. If you're just spending money on advertising on Amazon through, for example, sponsored products, your ad doesn't show up unless you're the buy box winner. So you can help yourself get a little bit better customer conversion, but all of your competitors could also be doing advertising and also helping to drive their sales. So it's a little bit of a vicious cycle. It costs you more money to get the buy box, but if you can find a way to get disproportionately more sales when you have the buy box, that, that will inevitably help you get a bigger share of opportunities to win the buy box. So that I mean that's that's one area to to help yourself. Unfortunately, if you're on a competitive listing with lots of other companies, even if you're using FBA, if there's other guys also using FBA, there's not really a lot of things you can do. You can submit content, but unless you've got a, th a content authority so that your content is going to show up, um, and even so, the improved customer conversion that comes with better content is going to end up being shared by everybody on the listing. So there's not a lot that you do to help yourself without also raising the water level for everybody else on the listing. Now, is that where pricing and the importance of, of playing with your pricing can kind of give you somewhat of an edge? Uh, and how often do you want to be tweaking your pricing? You know, you don't really want to get into a penny war here, uh, but you do have to be aware of your competition. So I can't answer that question before I understand two major issues. Number one, do I have pricing constraints put on me by the distributor or by the manufacturer? Number two, do I understand my profitability on that SKU very well? If I'm prepared to lose money, okay, fine, we have a different set of rules. If I don't really understand my costs, then I wouldn't get into repricing at all. Because quite frankly, you're probably going to set your floor price too low and you're going to lose money. Congratulations, you got the sale. Amazon made money and you didn't. Why are you in this game? So, uh, there, there are situations where there will be competitors and one of you is using a repricer and one of you is not. And you know you can slowly, slowly, slowly drive down the price in order to get the sale. Uh, you'll also, of course, reduce your margin. Right. But you'll get to a point where the second somebody else also has a repricer, you, you've now got competing repricers going up against each other. And you may have a repricer that reprices every 15 minutes and somebody else reprices every 30 minutes. But inevitably, the margin gets squeezed out of the product completely for everybody. Um, I've also seen situations where if I use a repricer and one of my competitors knows what he or she is doing, late at night, they can change their price. And they, unless you set a proper floor price on your repricer, I can clear you out of your inventory and buy it all for a buck. And then I'll just put my price back up to what I want. Well, um, <laughs> <laughs> what am I supposed to say other than, okay, great, you got a repricer, you won the buy box, you got taken advantage of because you didn't really understand how to set up the repricer effectively for your product, and you made no money, of course. Um, so I don't, I don't really have a, I don't have a clear answer for you. I think the moment you get into using repricers, you have to know that you're playing with fire. And fire is a good thing if you know how to play with it, but lots of sellers don't know how to play with it effectively. I prefer a model that says, 
if I'm going to be active on Amazon as an Amazon seller, what am I doing to create some sort of short-term or even medium-term advantage where I can secure product that nobody else can secure, that I can work with the manufacturer to become at least a semi-exclusive seller on the, on the listing and be able to lock down content by being their brand registry owner? What can I do to encourage the brand to give me preferential uh, preferential payment terms or preferential pricing. It's not unlawful for a brand to charge different prices to every reseller. Sure. And so if I've got more room to work with, great. All too often, resellers don't know to ask these things. If they're buying from a generic site where you just place the order and the product gets shipped out, there is no negotiation that goes on. But if you can demonstrate that you can make certain minimum purchase quantity commitments, then, then potentially you can negotiate a better price that gives you a little bit more room to play with when you're trying to get the sale. Well, and it's interesting. If, if, I, if I can just add one more thing, Justin. I, I've heard folks many times say to me that the sale is won when you buy the product wholesale. Like when you wholesale it, that's where you make the profit. Not when you sell the product. It's when you buy the product. That's where you make the money. Too many resellers focus on what's going to happen at the time they sell the product. And yet the opportunity to make profit is all based on how they negotiate when they acquire the product in the first place. Think of what think of what re retail arbitrage sellers do. The really good ones have very sophisticated software in place that helps them understand exactly what price they can afford to buy the product at in order to make a certain required margin. If, if the product doesn't hit that threshold, they don't make the purchase. Unfortunately, a lot of traditional resellers don't have the same level of insight on a skew by skew basis. So they make purchases and they say, well, there must be enough margin here. I can see, you know, I back out Amazon fees and you know, it looks like there's a little bit left. But as I mentioned at the beginning of the discussion, there's a lot of other types of costs that you have to incur and factor into your numbers. The retail arbitrage folks typically have a much better understanding of that and can make very calculated decisions to say, these are all widgets. I'm looking for the widgets that make me money. And I need to understand my all-in costs so that I can make the money, I can get into a product, get out of the product. Well, that's the same mentality that I think a reseller that doesn't have good, uh, good, good negotiation with the brand, they have to take exactly the same uh, mentality. All they do is sell widgets. And what, what their focus should be is on being really good at procuring and getting the best prices on those widgets. It doesn't really matter whether they like a product. It doesn't really matter if the product sells a lot of units across all the sellers on Amazon. Those things don't really matter in the end if, if the reseller doesn't have any differential advantage over everybody else who could do exactly the same thing buying the product. Well, well that leads into an interesting discussion. We'd like to ask all the people who appear on the Amazon Fanatics program. And again, sure. we're talking to James Thompson, who's the president of the Prosper Show. And we have a few minutes left with James, so we are going to ask him about the Prosper Show. But but there are so many software, so many apps, right. so many offerings, and some are as cheap yep. as, you know, ten bucks a month and some yep. you know, twenty five hundred dollars, you know, flat fee. Yep. Are there softwares that stand out to you that if you say, Okay, if you're going to be a third party seller on Amazon, you know, these are the ones you need to check out to at least increase your chances of success? So I'm going to answer your question a little differently than most people probably do. We love that. Uh, <clears throat> as, as a member of the, the, the Prosper Show organization, we welcome many different software companies from many different areas to participate. And while I may have personal preferences on which, which uh, providers I like most, in fairness to everybody, I'm not going to comment on who I think is better or worse for particular types of sellers. What I'm happy to talk about is what forms of software make a lot of sense for new sellers to invest in right away. Okay. So number one, uh, if I'm a brand new seller and I'm in this for the long run, meaning I'm in this for at least two years, I know two years sounds pretty short term, but let's say I'm in this for at least two years and I recognize that I want to build my business, I want to build the right infrastructure to be able to support not only selling what I am selling, but potentially being able to add more catalog, change out the catalog. I'm going to need a few basic basic uh, third-party software tools to help me. Number one, I need to have some sort of a feedback uh, tool in place yeah. where I ask for feedback. I need feedback not just because I want to know what my, my customers are thinking about. I need feedback because Amazon tracks the proportion of sales units, excuse me, sale, the number of orders to the amount of feedback I get. And if I have a huge spike in orders, but there's not much feedback that follows, that proportion gets out of whack, 
and Amazon can slow down your, your, your disbursements. So I've got to have feedback in place. Even if I'm only getting 2 to 3% of orders where the customers leave me feedback, that's got to be first and foremost in place. The next thing I need to do is I need to look at what am I doing to manage inventory? If all I sell is on Amazon and my catalog's pretty small, I could probably go into Seller Central, set up a bunch of uh, replenishment alerts, and, and be able to track things okay. But if my catalog gets pretty big, or if I'm selling on other marketplaces or on my own website, I'm going to need some sort of an inventory order management system to be able to support what it takes for me to keep in stock on products that, that I know are going to, uh, to be productive for me. And the third area where I think you need to have software is you need to have some mechanism to be able to track profitability. I've talked about this a couple of times, and, and different packages out there use different levels of cost assumptions. But rather than saying one is better than another, what I would encourage folks listening today to do is go and vet different types of different types of, of, of profitability software and ask yourself the question. Do I really understand what my all-in costs are on a skew by skew basis? Until you have insight on that, I think you're just wasting a lot of time trying to make Amazon money. So th th there are tools, many of the inventory order management tools will have some profitability analysis factored in. Um, some of the FBA inventory tools will have profitability factored into them. There are also standalone profitability tools for Amazon sellers. And literally, if you just go to Google and you type in Amazon profitability software, you, you'll find a few of these. Um, again, I'm not going to I'm not going to call out any one company specifically, but having done the due diligence of identifying which one of those tools makes sense for the new seller, I think it's important, as I say, to have feedback software, have some sort of inventory order management software if your business involves more than a handful of products uh, and it, it involves more than just Amazon, and then finally profitability software. If you cover those three areas off, I think a lot of the the day-to-day -day annoyances of being a seller, tracking everything on a skew by skew basis, a lot of that can go away just by having those particular three types of software in place. All right, and, and that actually leads us into our last question is, let's talk a little bit about the Prosper Show and what it offers sellers and software companies and, and why it's become such a must attend event. And I know that's more a statement than a question, but I, I will flip it and say, why is the Prosper Show such a must attend event? Let me start by saying, who's Prosper Show aimed at? Because as much as I'd love all Amazon sellers to come to our event, uh, realistically, it, it's designed for certain types of sellers. It is, it, is a, it is a continuing education conference designed specifically for sellers that are realistic about investing in the future. They're saying, I don't know everything I need to know about my business, but my business is more than just a side project. It's, it's really a business, and I'm investing a couple of days. I'm investing some good money in a ticket. I'm flying all the way to Vegas to do the show. And while the show may be in Vegas, let's be very clear, this is an educational event. For sure. If you choose to come in early or leave a few days late and enjoy Vegas for its party scene, that's your business. But we throw a lot of, a lot of content from really amazing people. We throw a lot of content at the attendees. And I mean, one, one of the complaints I got last year from one of the attendees was, there's too much information being thrown our way. My brain hurts. Well, you know, we, we record everything. So you can come back and you can watch it again at some later point. But we want attendees to come to the event and learn so much about things they think they know about but don't really or about issues that they've never really considered but recognize are actually important to address in order to continue to have a successful long-term business. Those are the kinds of issues that we cover. Those are the kinds of people that we're targeting. Uh, and quite frankly, um, we, we, we were very successful this last show in February 2016. We, we had over 50% of our sellers were doing over a million dollars a year on Amazon. Wow. So th these are larger, many of them are larger sellers who are saying, while I've been on Amazon for three or four or five years, I still don't know a lot of intricate aspects about the business. Um, we had we had about a dozen ex-Amazon folks at our show presenting. We're going to have about that number again this time, plus a number of leading industry speakers, folks who focus primarily on education. This is not a sales event. This is an educational event. Yes, we have a room of what I believe are leading exhibitors, companies who are service providers and solution providers who can help take uh, our, our attendees' businesses to the next level. But this is first and foremost, how do we help people understand what are the issues that affect their business and what are ways of solving that? 
and then they can engage in a sales discussion with some of these leading exhibitors. Well, we are uh, we are already planning to be there. Uh, uh, Mark and I from Fanatics Media, right. we are quite looking forward to uh, our in con- continuing education and seeing everything the process has to offer. James, I want to thank you so much for your time today. It was very generous. Uh, we had some uh, technical difficulties that you folks watching at home won't see, but uh, James was uh, very kind to spend some extra time making sure we sorted through those, and it was a very, very educational interview. Let me just say again, James Thompson is the president of the Prosper Show, so make sure you go uh, check that out if you're an Amazon seller who wants to increase your education. Uh, and he is also a partner in buyboxexperts.com, and you're going to want to head over there and see how they can probably uh, uh, increase the knowledge of your business about 10,000-fold, it seems, uh, just from talking to those guys. So, James, I want to thank you so much again for your time today, and we look forward to uh, hopefully talking to you again down the road.